So my objective for this morning's talk is actually fairly uh, succinct. Um, my goal is to improve the management of TIA patients in the ED through a multidiscipline, collaborative, best evidence, and a translation into practice. And I hope that that will come through during the presentation this morning. These are the topics that I plan to cover. Uh, they say we have a fair bit to get through. Um, so why do we care? Um, the burden of uh, stroke is, is fairly high in, uh, around the world, and particularly in North America. It's the third leading, leading cause of death in Canada, and it's the leading cause of adult disability in Canada, and has a fairly large price tag. And probably more important than those facts, are, as we all know, stroke is a devastating illness. Disabling stroke can take otherwise healthy, functional people, often at young ages, and make them uh, nursing home candidates and very disabled. So it's a devastating disease. There's been sort of a tradition in emergency medicine that we really um, feel very little role in the treatment of strokes. We kind of have a nihilism about strokes and feel very powerless because we don't really have anything to offer these patients. Um, and as you are well aware, there's a lot of controversy and skepticism in the acute management of stroke. And I think that uh, leads to some of the nihilism that a number of us uh, may uh, experience in our specialty. Um, and the bottom line is stroke just is not very sexy. Stroke care is not considered a very uh, cool thing in emergency medicine. But despite those facts, um, I think preventing a stroke is way cool. Um, and I would ask you to consider that unlike many of the conditions we treat every day, Diagnosing and managing TIAs effectively offers emergency physicians an opportunity to make a huge difference in our patients' lives, to prevent disability and suffering, and to save a life. But we can say that about only a small handful of conditions that we treat. So just briefly as an overview, definition of TIA. The old kind of definition, which is a time-related definition, is a focal cerebral ischemic event that you know, lasts less than 24 hours. That's the definition that many of us learned. There is a new definition called a tissue-based uh, diagnosis or definition. Um, a transient episode of neurologic dysfunction caused by focal brain, spinal cord, or retinal ischemia without infarction. And the reason why that is becoming increasingly important in the definition is that we have mechanisms now to identify uh, minor infarction early on. The first question we have to ask ourselves as an emerge doc when we see a patient who presents with this acute neurologic event is, is this a TIA? So some of the factors that would make you convinced or consider that this is likely a TIA is that the symptoms usually onset maximally at the beginning. Um, that's obviously because if you have an occlusion of an ischemic vessel, the symptoms start right away. This isn't something that comes on over a long period of time. Symptoms must be localized to an obvious vascular territory. And things such as true motor weakness, speech disturbance, monocular visual loss, these are things that are very likely of vascular origin. Non-focal symptoms are not likely to be TIAs. And associated symptoms like shortness of breath and a leg pain and things like that are probably not TIAs. These are just another list of things that make you think that this is likely not a TIA. Symptoms that move around, things that are bilateral, things that are very brief, lasting only seconds, are very unlikely to be TIAs. Positive symptoms, such as shaking or visual flashing lights and things like this, are also unlikely to be TIAs. And as I mentioned, a gradual onset or march of symptoms are also very unlikely to be TIAs. Here's a little bit of a laundry list of TIA mimics. You'll all recognize this when you see a patient with an acute neurologic event that said, oh, could this be a TIA? This is kind of the list of things to think about as you go through your differential diagnosis. Remember that TIA is a clinical presentation. It's not a cause. It's really not really a disease, and unlike let's say acute MI, you need to do another step when you see a TIA, and you have to consider what is the cause of this TIA. And there are three distinct causes of TIAs. You see cardioembolic causes, 
large artery, thinking of carotid stenosis, carotid plaques, and small vessel disease, usually in the setting of uh, hypertension or diabetes. They could all present with TIAs. They have all a different mechanism, and most importantly, they have a very different treatment and prognosis. So whenever you see a TIA, you make a diagnosis of TIA, you write TIA on the chart, you should always think, what is the cause of that TIA? In 2000, Johnston um, published a paper in JAMA, which was a little bit of a, a landmark paper because it brought people's attention <clears throat> to something which maybe was not so well known. And he looked at what's the short-term prognosis of patients who present to the eMERGE with a TIA. This is the graph that's important to look at. And what he showed is that in the next 90 days, there is a significant rate of a completed stroke in people who first present with a TIA. And it's of the order of about 10%. It's a very front-end loaded risk. The most of that risk actually occurs in the first couple days. And in fact, if you look at this graph, you can see about half of it occurred within the 48 hours. And this is kind of the, the idea that I carry around in my own head. And it's 10 in 90, half in 2. That's a 10% risk of a stroke in the next 90 days. And half of that risk is in the first 48 hours. And the reference for this is Johnston's paper. So when you're talking to families or patients, this is a very good sort of tool to keep in the back of your mind. So if we know that stroke is uh, very common and a substantial risk after a TIA, is there anything we can do to reduce that stroke? I will just present one uh, chart here from Rothwell's paper, which showed in the express trial that early intervention, and in this case it was antihypertensives and antiplatelets within 24 hours, showed a dramatic reduction in the incidence of stroke. This has been repeated several times in many publications, and it really goes to the importance of very early intervention. We do have very good evidence to suggest that it can reduce the incidence of completed stroke. But not all patients have the same risk of stroke. And so it raises the issue, can we pick out who those patients are? Can we risk stratify TIA patients? And the reason we need to do that is we don't have unlimited resources. Um, and so it's probably most important that we pick out those patients who need to be seen urgently, who need urgent interventions. So can we do that? So Johnston in 2007 published a paper on the ABCD squared score you are all familiar with this scoring system. And basically what he showed is that as the ABCD score, squared score went up, the incidence of stroke went up. And I would just draw your attention to another trial which showed the most important feature is focal weakness. A three-fold increase in completed stroke if you present with focal weakness. There was a systemic review done in 2010 uh, which looked at over almost 10,000 patients with TIAs. And came to the conclusion that the ABCD squared score had a good predictive value for completed stroke. We're all familiar with Jeff Perry's publication, which was in CMAJ last year, 2012, I can't remember, I think 2012, um, eight Canadian EDs, and they came to the different conclusion that it really was not very accurate. Um, so if you look at the ABCD squared score and you look at um, uh, if it doesn't predict stroke, what does it predict? Well, this is an interesting paper suggests what it really is predicting is people who don't have a TIA to start with. That is, if you have a very low ABCD squared score, there's a much higher likelihood you have a non-cerebral cause for your acute neurologic presentation. The higher the score, the more likely you are to have actually have a TIA. So it might not that it predicts the risk of stroke, but it actually predicts who has a TIA in the first place. Another option or another possibility is that the ABCD squared score doesn't predict an event, but what it does show is that the higher the score, the more likely you are to have a severe stroke if you have an event. So the bottom graph shows that the incident wasn't really that much different depending on the score, but if you look at the top graph, the darker lines are major strokes. And as the score was higher, those events that they did happen turned out to be major events. So the bottom line is there are significant um, limitations to the ABCD squared score uh, to the point where the current guidelines don't really recommend using it. 
Um, having said that, there, there does seem to be some validity to a number of the items that are in that scoring system, and we'll talk about that. Also, most importantly, it doesn't take into account the stroke mechanism, and it also takes in, does not take into account any uh, vascular imaging abnormalities, and it biases against young patients. So, if we can't use a clinical scoring system, is there another way we can stratify patients? And a lot of attention has been put on imaging. Can we use some imaging to help risk stratify TIA patients? I will just show you sort of one graph from a paper, this is from Britain, recent paper, which showed as the ABCD squared went up, the likelihood of infarction on, on MRI or CT was higher. So there seemed to be some correlation between the clinical score and vascular abnormalities or tissue abnormalities on MRI scanning. And, in, and from the same paper, it showed that if you had MRI abnormalities, your risk in the next seven days was 7%. Um, and if you didn't have DWI abnormalities on your MRI, your risk was actually quite low. So raising the possibility, we could probably use imaging to help risk stratify our patients. This is another paper a couple years ago which looked at vascular, so not just tissue on an MRI, but let's look at the pipes, let's look at the vascular tree that we could get from neuroimaging, and can that help us? And what this showed is that if there's a carotid stenosis evident on the neuroimaging, that there's a major increase in the risk. So if it's more than 70%, as you can see at 90 days, it's about 25% risk of having a completed stroke. And again, it's very front end loaded. If it was 50 to 70%, you can see the risk is sort of intermediate. But if there's no carotid stenosis, or at least less than 50%, the risk is only about sort of 5% at 90 days. So again, the suggestion that some vascular findings on imaging can help risk stratify our patients. I won't go through many pa other papers, but there are many papers which come to the same conclusion. And I would make the conclusion that neurovascular imaging has clearly demonstrated its ability to identify TI patients at very high short-term risk of stroke. The CATCH paper is a sentinel paper in my mind, which is actually came out of Calgary uh, back in 2012. So Michael Hill and, and Andrew Demchuk there did this trial where they looked at CTA, and they said, you know, MRI is difficult to get, uh, difficult in Canada as well as in Europe in many settings. So could we use a CTA? And they enrolled 510 patients. These were high-risk patients, so motor weakness, speech disturbance. Um, they got their CTAs within, you know, five to six hours of the patient having their onset of symptoms. And what they found is that about 50% of their patients actually had vascular abnormalities which were in a range of stenosis that would put these patients at high risk. They also found, because they did DWI on many of these patients' MRIs, that a large proportion of their patients already had evidence of infarction despite the clinical diagnosis of TIA. This is kind of the money slide from that trial basically showing that you can divide patients out into low risk and high risk based on whether they have abnormalities on their CTA. So the conclusion from that trial was that the adoption of CT and CTA into clinical practice for the assessment of TIA patients would identify a high risk group suitable for aggressive acute stroke prevention. And that's really what we want to do. We want to use risk stratification using a risk stratification score and imaging to pick out those patients who we need to jump on now with aggressive treatment. And also, conversely, identify a group, a cohort of patients who are probably at very low risk, and perhaps they can be seen in a more leisurely manner. 